thank you very much for being on this uh, panel with me. Uh, I'm glad to, uh, to see you here. I'm glad to be in Helsinki for uh, this super exciting conference. I will start just letting you give a brief introduction to yourselves and to the funds that, uh, that you represent. So, you're right next to me, Morgan. Take away. Yes. Hello. Oh, my microphone is on. Great. So, uh, Morten Skoga, uh, I've uh, uh, co-founded some deep tech uh, companies, my first one in 1999, uh, and later on Toby, uh, the global leader in eye tracking. Uh, but we've come together now uh, with a new team, uh, Node.vc. Uh, we are founders, uh, and we're backed by founders, uh, and we claim to know a bit of tech. So we are an early stage uh, Nordic investor, uh, based out of Stockholm, but with a Nordic reach. Great, thanks. And then over to uh, our American in Sweden, Tanya and Paula Ventures. Thank you, Michael. Uh, great to see everybody again and be back here at Arctic. Um, so Tanya Horowitz, partner of Butterfly Ventures. I started my, my career in financial services in uh, Wall Street and started my first VC fund in, in New York, actually, and then had the lucky chance to move to Stockholm, Sweden in 2013 and invested across the, the pond, so to speak. Um, and then I joined Butterfly Ventures in 2016. Uh, so today, Butterfly Ventures is investing out of its fourth fund, uh, which we just launched last, last year. Um, we are the leading deep tech seed entry impact focused fund in the regions. We invest in the entire uh, Nordics and Baltics. We have offices in um, in Oulu, which is actually the original headquarters, um, Helsinki, Stockholm, where I am. Uh, we also have offices in Copenhagen and in Tallinn. Um, so we've invested over 91 companies, 260 investment plus rounds. It keeps adding. I'm in closings on some right now, so we'll see if that count goes up. Um, and uh, yeah, so really excited to be here and talk further about Deep Tech. Great. And finally, Pontus. Yes, hi, I'm Pontus Trollman. So I'm a serial entrepreneur turned angel investor turned VC. So I'm now a partner at Voima Ventures. Voima is uh, investing in the Nordic and Baltic science-based innovation and the commercialization of those innovations through startups. So we back uh, deep tech startups that have a global impact. It can be health tech, it can be climate tech, uh, as long as, as we see, uh, you know, really, really hungry and, and ambitious founders. I perhaps still identify myself more as an uh, entrepreneur than an investor, uh, but I didn't do any deep tech uh, as an entrepreneur. I, I had distribution companies, so I did a lot of sales and, and marketing. I think that's, that's enough great. of my background. That's a good introduction. Maybe I should introduce myself also, at least in the fund that I work for. Uh, it's called Rockstar. It is a Dutch early stage investor. We invest from very, very early stage pre-seed across three domains, agri-food, energy, and then the latest one that I'm managing, which is emerging tech. We do maybe one out of three investments in each of those funds in something that looks like deep tech or is very much deep tech, but we also do a lot of other investments. And I'm Danish and based in, uh, in our office in Copenhagen. But you startup on is actually a little bit defines deep tech as science-based innovation. Deep tech has you know, many different shapes and forms, and sometimes people try to tweak a case into being deep tech, which is the theme of this panel also. Are you really a deep tech investor? But is there anyone in the panel who would like to offer a, a more precise, a different definition of what is deep tech than science-based innovation? Please offer up your thoughts on what it is. I think it's a pretty good definition. Uh, so it, it comes from significant research uh, as the background. Uh, similarly to you, Node is not a purely deep tech investor, but we do deep tech investments as well. Uh, but I think deep tech is generally also uh, within areas where it's possible to get a patent and to protect it. And so, the, so what you build is a, a, a technology where, where already the technology itself has barriers of entry. Yeah. Yeah, and 
and the way we define it at Butterfly is, is very similar, research, science-based. Um, but I would say that not all of our, so in our fund three, for example, we invested in 27 companies, approximately 63% of those came from sort of university research or spin-off or was collaborative in some way uh, with research and science. And so, but, but it, so it doesn't always have to have that element. There are obviously other, um, so AI, ML, um, applications, of course, as well, can be considered deep tech, right? So, you know, and then those don't necessarily always come out of some sort of university research. Um, but, you know, we, we do look at make sure, obviously, there's defensibility, right? And, and, and that could be IP, as I mentioned. Um, you know, but also there could be IP within the team. Um, and so that's kind of where that research comes from, if you will. Yeah. Okay, so. Venture funds, some invest in deep tech, some say they do, some definitely don't. Um, and reasons for why they don't, some would say is because it's too capital intensive. It's too risky, uh, technological risk versus commercial risk, easier to go into a software play. Uh, and also the fund life cycle of a, like a VC fund is typically at least maximum 10 years, plus some optional years, sure. That's too late to really provide returns. If you look at research, numbers out there, they also go a bit of both ways, right? There are many arguing, sure you can invest in a VC uh, in deep tech. Let me have your thoughts on this, so that also the people here will understand some of the dynamics behind you deciding to invest in and allocate capital to deep tech. What's up? Well, if I start, I mean, look, when you think about a, a VC fund, you have to think about the 10 next years, not, not the 10 past years. And, and you have to think what kind of solutions the world needs for the coming next years. And, and at Voimo Ventures, and me personally, I mean, we strongly believe that the world really needs solutions, new solutions based on, on completely new innovations. It, it needs excellent SaaS companies as well, so there, there will be great SaaS companies in the future as well. But the need for real innovation to, to solve these large global uh, problems and crises that we are heading towards uh, are so big that we definitely believe in deep tech. Absolutely, and, and we mirror that as well, as you know, because we, we do a lot together. Yes. So, um, and, and, you know, obviously climate's one thing, society's another, health's another, I mean, you've got an aging population, right? Um, so, all these kind of deep tech research, whether it's research or science-based um, or not, are hopefully helping to create solutions for a better world, safer world for our children. Um, and so, you know, I think that you know, we look at it as, okay, yes, it can be capital intensive. And, and we drill down, when we, when we look at, we invest early, so we're seed entry only. And so we have to make sure we see a pathway to through Series A. If we know that the, the company we're looking at, whether it's in quant computing or some other, you know, kind of these new edgy <laughs> technologies, right? If they're gonna need 10 million or they're gonna need 50 million, what are they going to need in the, in the next rounds? And you know, we're not a huge fund, right? So can we continue to fund that? I think that's also another you know, thing that we have to look at when we make those early stage pre-seed or seed investments. To sustain your position on the cap exactly. table, basically. Exactly. Right? You don't want to get too diluted in a huge round, Correct. Or several huge rounds. But also, perhaps there is a lack of capital yeah. at that next round. We don't want to be stuck holding the bag, so to speak, right? Um, and so we need to make sure that there are other funds out there, whether it's in Europe or the US, that would have an appetite for this type of you know, technology going forward. Do you have a take on this one? Yeah, I think uh, what you describe is uh, extremely relevant for us as well. I think uh, for us it's important. We're, we're, not, we're not worried about technical risk in general. It, it's possible to assess whether or not something... Of course, there are technical risks. But I think uh, the most challenging thing is many a times to change behavior. So we need to... Uh, 
we need to be able to understand who is the customer of this and is there really a market demand and what, how will it be sold. Uh, so I think that's an important aspect. Uh, given that you can answer that, then, then being a deep tech or not, I think, and, and I think, in many of these uh, challenges you describe uh, are addressed by the tech companies. Uh, I think uh, another complexity, and what you describe now in sort of the next round, is of course, uh, is this a company that requires a lot of capex? Do we have to build factories, or do you have to build like these uh, uh, hundred million euro prototypes? then we are usually a bit reluctant. We need to see how that, we need to understand the funding and the, the road forward. Uh, so these are important aspects. But uh, what would be the right type of investor for a company like that? Capex intensive? A bigger fund or a different kind of investor? It depends. I mean, there are, there are a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies focusing new technology on, uh, on uh, uh, green transition, like uh, new approaches for hydrogen storage or uh, uh, battery technologies applied in uh, new areas or uh, floating offshore wind. Or I mean, there are these things that uh, you build really big things and it's, it ends up being almost infrastructure investments uh, before the technology is fully proven, which I think is a challenging area. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of trends in this direction. So if you navigate uh, well, you can be a, a, an important uh, supplier into these fields. And do you do a bunch of, uh, I'm, I'm sure you do, when you look into the numbers, your return profiles, you've been at it for quite some years now. So on deep tech investments, can you debunk the myth that they don't provide adequate venture returns? I mean, of course, you will have some hit and misses, but in well, general, compared to the software games, the SaaS platforms, etc. Well, we have extremely happy LPs who, who are satisfied at our returns. Certainly, debugging that on a on a larger scale would definitely also require looking back at the past ten years when when we think that, that these mobile games, for instance, were huge successes and, and you'd have to also then uh, truly believe that that same success will continue for the next 10 years. So like I said earlier, uh, I think VC investing is so much about looking into the future that, that you are going to have to, as a fund, be able to explain a huge, large, bold vision for the next 10 years and find those LPs who, who like believe in that vision. But a, certainly a, a, a huge part of that vision needs to be that the financial returns will be adequate and, and great enough to, to take on the risks we did them. But I think that those risks are the whole time becoming smaller and smaller due to the increased demand that we see for these solutions. I wanted to get very specific. There might also be some founders out here uh, listening to this session and curious about their deep tech companies and what, what do these guys actually do to look at and consider deals. So um, maybe do a, a round uh, on what do you feel need to be in place for you to consider a company within deep tech? Just to discuss a little bit about patent, uh, you know, IP, etc. But there may be other things. So what would you look at? So we invest in companies not only in deep tech, and I think uh, what Pontus said here, we need to have big visions and ambitious founders. We want to see, and we want to have a full team in place. Obviously, there can be need to add a person or two sort of on the, on the core team, and, and obviously a, a company needs to grow over time. But we want to see a team in place. Uh, we want to see that they really know who the customer is and how they will sell their solution. Uh, usually, 
that turns out to be an iterative process, but they need to have a hypothesis that we are able to somehow validate by talking to a customer. Then in general, of course, I mean, if it's a deep tech uh, area, then having strong pet portfolios, especially, I mean, if it's a large investment to actually build the technology, and if you're supplying it perhaps on a license base or selling through uh, in ways where it would be possible, but possible for someone else to replicate, then a strong patent portfolio is, uh, of course, crucial. So I suppose the, the challenge of the research space, if you take the deep tech, it can be a little bit tricky to actually prove what is the commercial traction you're going to get, how are you actually going to sell, because you haven't really built it yet. You might have an idea. But I think, uh, I think what Pont just came across here, I mean, we're talking about sort of, okay, where is the world transitioning and what do we see as an expectation? That sort of the, the green transition, we know that there will be a demand for uh, green energy. Uh, and I mean, we, we have the whole electrification trend, and we have, there are these trends that show that, okay, there will be a market. So then, of course, we need to somehow, there can't be, I mean, as a VC, there are always unknowns. It, it is, okay. you're assessing risks, but, uh, but you, you want the number of stack risks to be as few as possible. Did you add something, Tanya, in terms of what well, you I mean, I, cases? Yeah, so I, I agree a lot with what Martin said, but um, I mean, for us, we look at three things. We look at the team, which is super important. I mean, that's like probably our number one, if you will. Um, and a lot of times when we look at a pre, pre seed case, there may not be a full team, and sometimes it's even pre you know, pre, pre pilot even. Um, so we have to then go, okay, what's the market, you know, looking like, right? What are the trends that we might be potentially seeing? How big is that market? Is it a billion plus market, right? Is it solving a pain for the end user, right? Um, so that those, those two are super, super important. And then of course the technology. The tech has got to be solid, it has to be defensible. Um, and so, you know, you put the three of those pillars together, then you start having the makes of the potential opportunity. And then, typically I go a step further, and, and I might reach out to um, an end user, so corporate, let's say, and, and kind of say, hey, is this something that is of interest, or would you consider using this? A lot of times, I don't have to do that. It, it, seems, it seems like the cases we've been seeing are a little bit further along. There already has been some proving, but when we do get those very early stage cases that we have to do some homework on, then we always talk to the customers that they already have, but then also reach out to our own individual network and, and kind of do our VP that way. You have more to add, uh, Pontus? These are all, of course, really, really important parts. But at the end of the day, I, I think it's also a lot about storytelling. You know, you have to have a good story. And, and it, it can't be science fiction. It, it needs to be science-based. But it, it, it still has to have all the same elements of a good story. I mean, it, it needs to have a, a noble purpose. It, it needs to have a credible way of, of making money. It needs to have a super exciting team to, to uh, you know, jump on that journey to, to change the world. So, so I, I think that indeed, that I quite often hear these pitches about a certain feature that someone's come up with, and I'm like a bit frustrated in, and asking like, so what? And, and will my 15% that I own of this in 10 years' time really be a fun returner if, if the storytelling, like, can't paint a big picture? But sometimes we help them in the storytelling and, and try to lift up the ambition level. But, but I, I think that it's really about this sort of ambition level that comes up in the whole story. So vetting these technologies, which can be quite broad, but you cannot be experts on all technologies, neither can I. So what do you actually do? Uh, Tanya, you talk about calling a customer, but they potentially buy this. But you also talk about vetting the tech, the tech is important. So you have, you phone a friend, 
if you don't know the tech, what, what do you, uh, you have a network of people you can reach out to up Zoom, or what do you do specifically to vet the tech? Should I start? Yeah, but I mean, of course, you talk to, you, you find the experts in the field and talk to them. First of all, we do, do what we can sort of assess, okay, is this relevant? I do, we do everything you described here, and I think the storytelling is extremely important before the tech, just to, because if you can't convey, and, and that's also an aspect of, now I'm shifting away from your question here, but <laughs> <laughs> the storytelling is really, uh, you get really short time to get your story through. You need to convince me, but you also need to convince the customer, and then you, we need to be convinced that you convince the next investor. You have to have a short punchline or a short story to come through, and, and to be able to uh, to to prove that it's you're solving a pain point. It's not a nice to have feature. This is a must have for the end customer. Okay, over to tech. We. We look at, of course, okay, what are the alternatives, what, what problem are they solving? And, and we try to assess what other ways are there of, of being able to solve this. Uh, and then we try to look at, try to talk to the experts in the field and look into, talk to the people in relation with the research that has been done. And then you look at uh, the patent portfolio to see, okay, what are, what do we see as a way of being able to bypass this? And then, of course, a lot of discussion with the tech team. What are, I mean, one thing is, where are you now? But a, an equally important part is, okay, what is sort of on your to-do list? What's the plan for the next three years? What do you need to, how will this improve? Okay, you're 60% better than competition now, but the question is, okay, everyone is moving on this problem, so why would you be three times as good as what you're now in three, three years from now? No. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, there is never a truth to this. You just need to try to make sure make sure to utilize you people and you know and get as many answers as possible. And quite often we bring uh, someone else to the table as well. We, we, we are quite uh, comfortable co-investing. I would say the whole VC space is very collaborative. Uh, we want to know who is the investor in the next stage. stage. But many times we bring someone we know is uh, strong in this field to the table and say, okay, let's together evaluate this. What, what else have you seen? And, and of course, compared to other companies we come across. One comment from either one of you on this, otherwise I have a next question also. We invest so early that quite often the tech simply is crap, right? It doesn't work, let's be honest. But, but if we have a great team that shows a lot of commitment, then we can take the risk that they'll get the tech also to work. Yeah. So that was a quick comment. That's a good comment. Very true, right? We're talking about startup investing. Yeah. You don't have everything uh, in order yet. Okay, I was uh, also the session before this, and we've touched on it as well. The future needs deep tech investment because it's going to be crucial to solving some of the challenges on this planet for our children, grandchildren, etc. And but I also have a sentiment, and I'm not the only one. If you look at different news media, that well, there was an abundance of money. A year ago, a year and a half ago, maybe, markets were different. So many investors had jumped on called so-called tourist investments into deep tech, pulling back a little bit, uh, trying to find more safe havens, easier returns. Is that what you're seeing? So if the world needs more deep tech investments, and quite a few people, not just VCs, but also LPs, are de-risking them pulling out. How do you see the landscape and the, uh, the outlook, I would say, for some of these essential deep tech? It's a grand question, perhaps, but share some thoughts uh, on this piece. I mean, I can, I can chime in on that. Um, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We've had a, a very challenging, what, past two to three years with a lot of different macroeconomic situations happening. And, you know, we, we've been in our fundraise, you know, and, and have seen some of the waves that have happened, if you will. Um, and so, you know, the deep tech area is, I would 
see that it's, it's definitely um, an area that is of interest to LPs. However, to your point, it, even the impact investors that, I mean, they, they look at this area as well, right? Because of what you said, solving the world's greatest challenges, right? But it depends, I think, on the type of investor that's investing in a, in, in a fund, right? So we've seen some pullback on the institutional side, for sure, because they're, they're recalibrating, right? Um, and, you know, but, however, I think that that will, the tide will turn. Um, and, and I think that the funds that have the, the ability to invest today in deep tech are going to be the, hopefully the winners in the next, you know, generation, if you will. Um, and so, you know, one last kind of comment on all that is that it's, you know, we are trying to solve the world's greatest challenges, and and you do have other organizations. So, like the EIC fund, for example, right? I happen to be on the advisory committee for the EIC fund, so they are specifically looking at deep tech. And I cannot believe the amount of companies that are coming through that program and are assessing right now. And thankfully, that three billion euro fund is there because then it helps to funds like ours perhaps to be able to, to invest and feel a little bit safer about going into you know, mitigating some risk, of course. So there are other programs and whatnot as well out there that you know, companies can look at and also funds can help um, uh, you know, spearhead off, basically. Just, well, I mean, if you want to invest in venture capital and, and you think that the blue ocean strategy uh, is a good way of investing in venture capital, do you really have a, a, an alternative to deep tech nowadays? Because we are really trying to bring these unique solutions that, that are bringing something really new and innovative to the market. So I think that within deep tech you can still find genuine blue ocean strategies. And, and for that kind of, of investors, I, I think that they should really have deep tech on their mind. Yeah. Quick comment for you, because that would be the last comment. <laughs> If you have. Uh, we're, we're a generalist fund, so I think we would uh, uh, actually uh, be able to get uh, quite a few LPs on board if we had been a sector-specific deep tech fund. Uh, there is uh, quite a few dedicated uh, uh, pockets for deep tech and for impact as well as clean tech. Uh, and I think it's needed. I think it's important because we really need to do this transition. Uh, but uh, we chose not to be only that. Yeah. Thanks. And with that being said, uh, I used to be in the army in Denmark, so I'm, uh, I have to be on time. And we got 21 seconds left, so I'll wrap up this session and say that we have um, established that we have three funds that really are deep tech investors, but that doesn't mean that you have to uniquely be a deep tech investor. Uh, we've established that there is definitely a need for deep tech investors to take place. That involves technical risks, aside from the commercial risk, um, and that there is money out there willing to do it. Um, I hope we also gave a little bit of an insight into the minds of the VC thinking about allocating capital to capital intensive, risky investments that the world needs. And thank you to uh, the conference uh, under the uh, hashtag of uh, Action Matters to let us discuss a little bit about that. Thanks to more from Tanya and Pontus uh, and give them a hand.